And uh, my first thought is to the organizer and especially to Michel Favre, who is uh, the Vice President of Artisan Europe, who is, by the way, um, a guy from the Institut Pasteur, and uh, so I met him at the Cantine every day. And then uh, he, he couldn't make it because for medical reasons, so I, I think of him. Um, so I will talk about the, the, the last finding uh, of my group and others on the um, autism and what I think, now I have some ideas of, uh, that's a problem maybe, uh, that uh, what autism could be. So first, um, this slide to, to show you that I, I like the double helix, I like um, ATGC, but it's really not the only thing which is important in autism, and, uh, and, but thank you for attending this genetics uh, session. It's, uh, I still like very much the double helix. So I will speak about uh, genetics. And the, the, the question is, why finding genes for autism spectrum disorders? And then I will give you my answer at the end of the talk. So first, uh, just to briefly uh, give you some update on the genome. Uh, the human genome is, um, so you know that in each of your cells you have uh, nucleus, and in each of your nucleus you have uh, DNA on, that are named chromosomes, and then on chromosomes you have genes. And it's very compact because you have about two meters of DNA in each of your cells. And on these two meters of DNA you have 3.2 billion of base pair, and it's very simple. It's ATGC, so uh, only four letters. Wow. And the good news is that when we s sequenced the genome, we found that it was not uh, 100,000 genes, but uh, something like 22,000 genes. The bad news is that between the genes, there are also information which are very important. So, I mean, it's really complex. and. Um, but we are we are progressing on the on the the human genome sequence and the the variations. So people ask me, how oh, do you look at DNA? So you can ampli you can isolate the DNA here, and you can use some technologies to amplify. And if you see a, a geneticist with sunburn, it's because he's working a lot because we are looking at the DNA on the UV. And you can see all this little uh, band here, uh, the, the DNA that we amplified from the genome. So we have many ways of looking at the genome. So we could look at using uh, microscopes and you can look at the chromosomes. But now, since the last uh, decade, we have very uh, sophisticated uh, techniques, including this, uh, what we call SNP, we'll tell you what it is in a minute. Uh, array that can interrogate uh, millions of variations in the genome. And very recently, we have the, the, the human genome sequence that can be done in a few hours for, for, for having the, the genome of one person, I mean, the part of the genome of one, of one individual. So, here it is. Welcome to the genetic session. And the difference between you and me at the genetic level is something like this, about one little change here. So maybe you have a T and I have a C, and maybe you have a G and I have an A. So this is the average difference between you and me. We have some variations which are the same. And these little variations are important. I mean, we call them SNP, it's called single nucleotide polymorphism. So about one SNP on 300 to 1,200 base pair. Base pair is the number of letters. So it's, it's important because this SNP, they makes us a little bit different. I come from the Pasteur Institute and i obliged to put a virus or a bacteria in my talk. So a lot of my friends are trying to find these little variations that could protect you or make you susceptible to, to infectious disease. And there is a lot of money spent to, to trying to see what are the variations that can, um, and, and that can really tell you what is a variation, 
when you when you take medics, for example, if you have to take one milligram of medics when you have a G and ten kilo of these medics when you have an A, something like this. So these variations are interesting, but this is uh, this picture to tell you what I think. I think genes don't care about the DSM-4. They probably don't care about the DSM-5, I fear. And so I think it's totally useless to think of one gene for one page of this book. And, uh, and all this field trying to find one gene for one page or two genes for one page, I don't know. But I think they don't care about the DSM-4. So we are looking for something else. And I think it's you and me, I mean, everybody in, in the field that have the answer, not, on, not the geneticists for sure. So I think like uh, Temple Grandin that autism is an extremely variable disorder. And I really like the idea that it's normally distributed in, in, within the population. And as you know, I mean, if you want to know where you are in the autism scale, you just have to type www blah, 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 and see where you are um, somewhere there. In, uh, in, in the non-autistic population, it looks like. So, um, and I also think that, like Hans Asperger, that uh, it seems that for success in science and art, a dash of autism is, might be essential. So I'm not here to normalize anybody, and I would like to understand what is, what's going on. So, uh, so since the last decades, there are many genes which were uh, associated with autism, and I I've done three categories. The first categories are genes that were already associated with autism with what we called uh, syndromic autism, so genes for fragile X, Rett syndrome, tuberous sclerosis. All these disorders, they have an increased risk of autism. Then there are genes associated with high risk for autism spectrum disorder, and so maybe one single mutation can really increase highly the, the risk of having uh, autism. And there, there is a lot of susceptibility genes for autism that are, the variations are present in this room. They really confer very low risk. And it's very difficult to date to see if these susceptibility genes are really susceptibility genes or noise. So, and my colleagues, geneticists, they don't like when I put this slide sometime, but the five questions you have to ask a geneticist if you meet a geneticist, and the guy say, to you I found a gene for autism. So you just have to ask him, are you working on animal models or humans? I have nothing against animal models, but you have to show that what you found in the animal models is also true in humans. The second question you can ask him or her is about the frequency and impact. The, the variations that you told us that are associated with autism, are they frequent in the population or rare? And is it high risk or low risk? The third question is about specificity. Uh, when you say you have a gene for autism, is it specific to autism or is it also um, Asperger syndrome, uh, learning disability, or other conditions? The fourth question is, uh, is it a pilot study or replicated? I mean, the, 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 the field is full of pilot studies, not replicated. So pl please, I, I love pilot studies, but it's, it's good when it's replicated. And the fifth question, even if you don't understand the questions, please ask, and you will see the face of the geneticist. Do you have functional evidence that your genes is a gene for autism? So even if you don't understand the question, please ask and you will see. <laughs> and most of the time, they have a p-value somewhere in the genome and they don't know what it means. And so please ask and see if these uh, studies were replicated and there are uh, functional evidence. So, so you can ask me these questions if, if you want. Uh, so my, I will talk about the synapses, what we found, and, and some of the, uh, the clocks that we are looking at. So synapses, I mean, you know that you, you came at birth with somewhat the same number of neurons that you have now. But during the two, three years of life, I mean, it was really like a fireworks of a lot of connections between your neurons. And we know better and better the, 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 the connections between neurons. We call them synapse. And we know better and better, and it's a very s s simple 
way of looking at the synapse. It's much more complicated in real life. And we know more and more about these little proteins that are doing a lot during uh, the, the, the development of your brain. So what we found is using quite um, classical techniques, uh, genetic techniques, we could find in 2003 some mutations in some of these proteins at the synapse. The first were uh, neuroligins, then shank, then neurexin, and uh, I will tell you some of these uh, results. So the first study, it's now two, 2003, was the identification on the X chromosome of a gene here called neuroligin 4. And it was deleted in some patients uh, with autism. Some patients uh, lose, uh, lost their, these genes. So we sequenced neuroligin 4 in um, families with autism. And we could find this family from Sweden with one person with autism and, her, and his brother with Asperger's syndrome. And they both carry a stop mutation. So normally the protein is that, that size, and, and the stop mutation truncates the protein, so it's not any more functional, as you will see in a, a couple of minutes. But at that time, we had only one, muta one family with one mutation. And we looked at the X chromosome, and we found a neuroligin-3, which looks like neuroligin-4. And we could find another mutation in one family, which is quite similar, with one child with autism and his brother with um, Asperger's syndrome. And I will come back to this mutation later. So you have to ask me if it was replicated. Yes, it was replicated. Uh, very soon after, the French group from uh, Sylvain Briot and, and Catherine Batelemy showed that in a, in a very large pedigree from France, all these individuals here had uh, intellectual disability and they had a neuroligin in four stop mutation. These two boys here has um, autism, typical autism, and this boy here has uh, pdd nos And they all carry a stop mutation of the neuroligin in four. So this family was important. It tells us that when a neuroligin in four mutations was in the brain of a male brain, Something happened, but something happened was sometime intellectual disability, sometime without autism, sometime autism, pdd nos and in our case of the Swedish family, Asperger's syndrome. Then it was replicated, um, and there are now many uh, studies replicating uh, the neon like in four. But still, there are some studies we didn't replicate. And I always say that John Vincent uh, is a good friend of mine, but he couldn't find any mutation in 196 individuals with autism. And I always say that he's a very, he's still a very good friend of mine. 